I just thank you and praise you, Lord, for all that you do for us and all that you are going to do for us. Thank you and I praise you, Lord, in so many ways in all of our lives, Lord. I just thank you that you give us breath each day, a new breath each day, Lord, to wake up in you and to live for you. I ask, Lord, that you would be with Jared as he comes and brings your word and your message this morning. And that you would bless our church, bless us throughout this week. And thank you for all those that are represented here. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right. So we picked up where we left off Nehemiah. Uh, chapter 3 today. It's a, it's a long chapter. And uh, I'll be honest with you, it's kind of a hard one to preach from. It might even be a hard one to read and think, what does this really have to do with the story of God? What's it have to do with me today? Uh, because there's a lot of this, this kind of big list of names and then what they what they're doing. But it's all part of the work that God is doing. The the Jerusalem bounce back, if you will. But there's some words in here and there's some key phrases and some key details that we're going to uh, touch on today that might enliven this part of the story for us. And so, as we do, I want you to kind of sit and think about perhaps a time when somebody unexpected helped you. Now, when it means somebody unexpected helped you, it's not that somebody unexpectedly helped you, it's that somebody that you would not have expected to be there, to somebody you would not have expected to help helped you. There's, there's, there's a difference, it's a very subtle difference, but what I, what I, I hope that question rests the way I'm intending it to, that you might have asked for help, and you were surprised by who said yes, or who came to help, or maybe you didn't even ask, but somebody helped you and you were like, I never thought they would have ever done that. Let's begin with the word. I'm a, there's a lot of names in here, and I'm going to say just about every single one of them wrong. Normally, I would sit and I'd look up the name if I knew this would be a hard name to type so I could pronounce it correctly. But when there's like umpteen names in one chapter, I just give up. Because I'm not going to remember. So, Elisha did. Elisha? Elisha, the high priest. And his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place, building as far as the tower of the hundred, which they dedicated, and as far as the tower of Hannah. The men of Jericho built the adjoining, uh, I'm just saying, the adjoining section, and Zakor, son of Emery, built next to him. The fish gate was rebuilt by some, uh, by the sons of Hassanah. They laid beams and put the doors and bolts and bars in place. Merimah, the son of Ariah, the son of Hokez, Hikez, repaired the next section next to him. Meshulam, the son of Berakai, the son of Meshulam, made repairs. Next to him, Zorek, the son of Dana, also made repairs. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisors. The Jashana gate was repaired by Joida, 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 son of Pesaya, and Meshulam, son of Pesaya. They laid the beams and put the doors, the bolts, and the bars in place. Next to them, repairs were made by the men of Gibeon and Mespah, uh, Balataya and Gibeon and Jaden of uh, Maranath, placed under the authority of the governor of the Transphrates. Uzziel, the son of Horeb, Horeb, one of, uh, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section, and Hananiah, one of the perfume makers, made repairs to the 
uh, there's the next step. They restored Jerusalem as far as the broad wall. Rephaiah, son of Ur, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section, and joining this, Jediah, son of Karama, made repairs to the opposite of his house in Hutesh, or Hetush, son of Hashkaniah, Haram, and Hesab, son of Ahat Moab, repaired another section of the tower of the ovens. Shalom, son of Halahesh, ruler of half the district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. The valley gate was repaired by Hanan and the residents of Zanala. And put its doors and bolts and bars in place. They also repaired a thousand cubits of wall as far as the dung gate. The dung gate was repaired by Belkeja, son of Rekha, ruler of the district of Beth Hekaram. He rebuilt it and put the doors and the bolts and bars in place. The fountain gate was repaired by Shalom, son of Kolheza, ruler of the district of Mizpah. He rebuilt it, roof over it, and put uh, and putting the doors and bolts and bars in place. He also repaired the walls and the pool of Siloam uh, by the king's garden, as far as the steps going down to the city of David, beyond him, Nehemiah, son of Azbek, ruler of half the district of Bethesda, made a to the point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool and the house of heroes. Next to him, the repairs were made by the Levites under the uh, Rehum, son of Benai. Beside him, as Shabiah, ruler of half the district of Kaleo, carried out repairs to the district. Next to him, the repairs were made by all of his Levites, Levites under Benuai, son of El. Hennedad, ruler of the other half of the district of Kila. Next to him, Ezra, son of Gosh, or ruler of this cup, repaired another section from the point facing the accent of the armory as far as the angle of the wall. Next to him, Baruch, son of Zabiah, zealously repaired another section. It's interesting, he zealously repaired it. From the angle of the entrance of the house of Elisha, the high priest. Next to him, Meramoth, the son of Uriah, the son of Hokez, repaired another section from the entrance. Elisha's house at the end of it. The repairs next to him were made by the priest from the surrounding region. Beyond him, Benjamin and Hesab, Hesab made repairs. In front of their house and next to them, Azariah, the son of Messiah, and the son of Ananiah, they repaired beside the house next to him. Benoi, the son of Hinnadad, repaired another section in Azariah's house. The angle of the corner in Palau, son of Messiah, worked opposite the angle of the tower project from the upper palace near the court of the guard. Next to him, Adiah, the son of Barash, and the temple servant living on the hill of Oakville, made repairs. To the point opposite the water gate towards the east of Project House. Next to them, the men of Tekoa repaired another section of the gate, projecting tower of the wall of Poland. Above the horse gate, the priest made repairs to the front of the house, uh, each in front of his own house. Next to them, Zoran, the son of Imar, made repairs opposite the house. Next to him, Shemaiah, the son of Shekaniah, the guard of the east gate, made repairs. Next to him, Ananiah, son of Shemanah, and Hunan, the sixth son of Zehoth, the sixth son of Zerah, interesting, repaired another section. Next to them, Meshon, son of Barakai, made repairs opposite the living quarters. Next to him, uh, of Egypt, one of the goldsmiths, made repairs as far as the house of the temple servants to the merchants opposite the inspection gates, as far as the room above the corner. Between the room of the corner of the sheep gates, the goldsmiths and merchants made repairs. That is the word of our Lord. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Now it would be easy to skip over this text and move on to the next chapter. It says opposition to the rebuilding. But you can wait until next week to read that, or you can read it on your own and pray about it, meditate on it, and see what the Lord has to say to you in your prayer and devotion time. I would encourage you to do that. But I, I also could have skipped a lot of this. I kind of probably paraphrased it. You know, a lot of other preachers probably would have because if chapter 3 had started at the top of the page, it would be over a page long. And there's really not a huge story here. Nehemiah is just a very detailed, oriented person. And he wanted all the details done. Ethan, can you hit the next slide? Next slide. Oh, I didn't say it. Oh, well. You get the 
idea. Nehemiah 3 is at the bottom, Psalm 121 at the top. But this is the game. All right, this is the, the what that he just described. And so to me, I'm a visual person. Visual aids help me a lot to help picture and understand what's going on. He makes this huge list, but all of these sections of the gate, of the wall, mean absolutely nothing to me. I have no idea what it means. And you know what? It's got real no theological significance. <laughs> but just to help bring us into the time, bring us into Jerusalem, and the, and the work that's being done, if you're looking at the top right-hand corner, there's a little gap. Maybe you can see it, maybe you can't. It's the sheep gate. And what has had just happened, Nehemiah 3 here, is he started and he went counterclockwise all the way around back to the sheep gate, explaining who repaired what sections of the wall. And that's what's really important. So this wall is actually smaller than the original Jerusalem wall, which is interesting and it makes sense because not all of the gates are accounted for. There are 12 gates and only 10 of them are accounted for. And that's because on the eastern side, so if you're looking at it on the right hand side, the wall would actually extend way further out. And it's on kind of a hill, but then it goes downhill and there's a valley down there with a nice big pool and, and, and some nice resources down there that Jerusalem would have also encompassed in that area. But maintaining its maintaining tactical advantage and also just using what resource he had available, rubble that was still good for use, they were able to construct this much of the wall, which actually placed Jerusalem entirely on top of the hill. So if Jerusalem and its walls were no longer down at the bottom or a portion of it, which means they maintained high ground. It's a good tactical advantage, right? Although this wasn't Nehemiah's purpose, this wasn't his point. It might have been something forward thinking in the future, but in his mind, he's more worried about the shame and disgrace on Jerusalem right now, and he wants it to be a beautiful city of God, where his people can come and gather together from the farthest points of the world and worship together. I mentioned that uh, sometimes we have unexpected help. Right. Um, and, and I sat and I thought about all these different times where I just like people helped, and they just I wasn't expecting it, you know. And I, and the more I sat thought about it, the more and more I realized, you know, there's probably a lot more in, instances than that immediately popped into my mind. And I think that's kind of unfortunate because I would love to remember. The times that people helped when I didn't think that they would have helped. That when they were a huge blessing to me, and I'm like, I would have never expected that. But the most recent one that I think of up at the top of my head was this actually, this actually during the camp um, for the youth club this summer. The youth club did their camp. Um, and I was out there, and there was a kid that was, he was here for the summer only. And he was. And we could not get his tongue under control. He was wild, rambunctious, defiant, obstinate, and he would just cuss anyone and everybody out. And then the, the even the constantly having to make like change his music and even take it away from him because he would just be blaring extremely inappropriate songs. And, and it was just such a headache. Yeah, it was a massive headache. It just... But for some reason, as we were at this camp, the very first day we were there, I arrived way earlier than everybody else. Now, the, one, the ones who were in, in the suburban, they were pulling a trailer and going to the sisters. They had to go really slow because they were really loaded down. The other van that had the other kids in it, they stopped at the rest stop at the, the travel center and loaded up on a bunch of snacks and energy drinks and stuff. Which was another <laughs> problem for camp. Um, every door to the cabins has like a big of a gap in it. So you can imagine the, the feast the animals had inside of their cabins. But they uh we got there way early. Oh, there was also some grading of the road going on. 
And I just drove through the sagebrush. I went off the road into the ditch and just went around them because they refused to like stop and let you pass, even though there was room. But you didn't leave that close while they're pushing rock and your rocks flying everywhere, right? And so I just drove through the sagebrush and went off roading a little bit to get around them. We got there way early, which means I got there really early with this kid. I wasn't excited about it. Just to drive down that drive there was not exciting. So I, I was going to, to do some work. And uh, I had actually I, I can't remember what I did, but I, I I called his name as kind of like a warning. And and I just I don't know if he was cussing or made a good joke or what it was. But I just kind of called his name on walking by, and rather than realizing that it was because of his mouth, he instantly stopped playing tetherball with the person he was playing with and came running over to me. And I was like, do you need something? And he's like, no, you called me. I figured you want my help. I was like, well, I was kind of surprised. I didn't expect him to stop what he was doing. Come help me. And then throughout the rest of the week, it surprised me how much when we said, We need your help. We need somebody to do this. We need somebody to mop the floors. We need somebody to, to come wash dishes. We need, it was always him that showed up. And so while it was him that I had to chase around until four o'clock in the morning through the woods because he kept sneaking out of his cabin, uh, it was always him who showed up when we asked for help. And it just surprised me every time. Last week we talked about how much pressure was on Nehemiah. The instant word got out, they were rebuilding the wall. In fact, that, that pressure that was on them instantly came from every region that surrounded Israel. Those who had political and economic power of Jerusalem. We also talked about how there were even people who were of great political influence and economic influence power in Jerusalem who were Jews that also opposed the work being done. And that was the first thing that's mentioned. Was the second the word got out, opposition from everywhere, all the way around us and inside, even. Was asked. But they didn't relent. They saw that the Lord was working through, through Nehemiah to get him head there with this mission. And they believe that God was at work and doing something. So each one, according to their capabilities, got to work. But what's interesting is that you notice there's a lot of people who, who were working the gate or the walls adjacent their house, adjacent their dwelling quarters, or, or somebody else's dwelling quarters and, and to like the next section. But I, I went through and uh, I circled, you probably can't see it because it's all in, I highlighted some things, but I also circled one thing, I don't think you can see it. I circled some of the people who were working on repairing the walls of Jerusalem. Yahweh's holy people. The high priest, if you remember, his granddaughter is married to a governor who is Jewish and opposes the wall being built. Can you imagine that the family tension involved in the work that's being done? One thinks, no, we should just, you know, kind of follow the words of Jeremiah and just seek the prosperity of Babylon in order that we would also prosper. But the others are like, well, clearly the Lord's looking through Nehemiah here, so we should rebuild and bring honor and 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 take away this disgrace that we can put on God and rebuild the walls. I, I can see a lot of family tension happening here. The high priest and the governor and his poor granddaughter in the middle of it, right? So everybody is affected by the wall being built. Everybody in some way, shape, or form. So, so we have the high priest, um, and then they dedicated the work so I want you to understand that the high priests, the priests, the Levites, they were all working on this. 
these are your royal, your, your, I shouldn't say your royal, but the royal in the sense that they're all the priests and ministers. Um, they were set apart to uh, tend to the study, the prayer of scripture, and the teachings, and the preachings, and the handling the, 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 the sacrifices, and then the temple duties, right? And, and the rest of the world, the rest of the, the Israelite world, they were to tend to all of their needs, right? So they were to, they didn't carry out jobs or professions or skill trades, except for studying scripture. That was their sole job. And, and that's what they're doing. They're getting to work, they're building these walls, but they dedicated it. Which meant that they believed wholeheartedly that they dedicated the same word and it would also be consecrated. They also believed that this was not just a, um, a first impression of people who come to Jerusalem. This was not just about shame or disgrace or honor or glory. The work that they were doing, the wall in of itself, the only thing else that had been consecrated was the temple. So to consecrate the wall is to, set, is to put this wall on this almost level playing field with the holy work set before them by God as it was with the temple. So they, it was the Lord's work that they were doing. And, and it was holy work. And just picking up stones and rubble and making mortar and stacking it and, and, and working together to to repair this wall was the Lord's work. You might have heard Emmanuel last uh, yesterday, if you were here, talking about uh, how he hates, hates, hates doing church work. But he tries to remember every nail is a person that might come to the Lord through the church, and every brush stroke might be another person, a uh, paintbrush might be another person that comes to know the Lord through the church's work. The work of building the wall was the Lord's work for the Lord's people, for the Lord's kingdom, for the Lord's witness in this world. So the men of Jericho also got to work. The men of Tekoa got to work. The men of Gibeon, the Mespah, and Melitia, and Gibeah, and, J uh, and Merna. Uh, goldsmiths were working on the wall. Perfume makers were working on the wall. Um, Ruler of half the district of Jerusalem. Okay, that makes sense. Even his daughters got to work on the wall. It was interesting. That's the only place that mentions that. Then. But he's the ruler. It mentions he is the ruler and says his daughters. So this may very well have been, and historically speaking, most likely, when he talks about his sons and daughters, it's talking about those who he governed. So we're talking all the men and women, uh, men and women of the uh, half of Jerusalem that he governs. And then we have, uh, uh, let's see, his daughters, the residents of Zenoa, uh, rulers of the district of beth rulers of the district of Mizpah, uh, half the ruler, the other half of beth Zer, uh, Levites, uh, son of Benai, the ruler of the district of uh, the Levites of Benai, Priests from the surrounding region, men of Tekoa, are mentioned again because they finished a part of the wall, they turned around and went to another part of the wall. Uh, the priests made repairs. Uh, the guard at the east gate <laughs> worked on his portion of the gate. Goldsmiths, again, is mentioned. Merchants are mentioned. People from all over. Came to work. Not just all over Jerusalem, all over Israel and the surrounding regions came to work. And not only did they come to work, but they brought people with them. Like their leaders came to work and they brought their people with them. And in fact, it was interesting, in another place here where it didn't say, oh, the men of Tekoa, but their nobles would not put their shoulder to the work under their supervisors. So, if you imagine the governor of a region sends, like, imagine like the mayor of, I don't know, Cheyenne, <laughs> sent his council 
with his city engineers to come do some work in Evanston, right? But now the city engineers and a bunch of other people of Cheyenne all got together and they all got to work, but the city council refused to do the work. Right? That's kind of what they're saying. Like all the nobles, but what it means is they they came and they still supported the work, they just, they're not gonna put their shoulder to it, <laughs> right? But they might have had some political influence. Their presence of being nobles meant that it was a huge thing to say, we support what is happening here. And we bring and we come with our people to also do it. A lot of people, I'm like, Tekoa is a long way. Tekoa is about five miles, it's a little place five miles south of Bethlehem. And so it's not like it's right next to Jerusalem. Where they thought the world all around them was caving in, and then there was even issues growing up from within side, there were people all over inside and people from far off areas all coming together to support and do the work of the Lord. Of just the, the rebuilding, the physical work. Well, when we're, when we're in this stress and this turmoil of life and the world and the pressure is just surrounding us and caving in, it's easy to focus on all the negative and not realize who all is around us that love and support us. And, and like we can say with the Koa, the nobles, not all people who do the work, not all people who don't do work or like are actively engaged in helping you doesn't mean they're against you. There's still people who would support you. And sometimes you just need some people that just say and speak encouragement into your life. And then there are some people who come and they do things to help rebuild you. We're also, I'm also kind of taken back by the idea that everything in this chapter, the words that are repaired over and over and over again, let's talk about the, the, the doors, the bolts, and the bars, or the, the gates. Over and over again. Well, it's interesting is that it talks about the word. The word used here is repair. Everything was repaired. We don't have like a rebuilt. I mean, it was it, what it once was is not what it is now. That wasn't the intent. It was repaired, and so it, what it means is it brought back structural integrity. And in our own lives, when the Lord is working in our lives to make us from what we once were to who we now will be, there are repairs being made, but the intent is never to make you what you once were. It's to make you what you are now. Right? So there's, there's repairs that are being made. And a lot of these repairs are being made with what's once was. And so we have a past, we have a history, we have parts of us that, have been, that are broken and burned down, but those are the parts that God wants to use to repair your life. And so we talk about what is, you know, that, that God works through our weaknesses, right? If we talk about how uh, he works all things together for his good. There, there's some bad things that happen, and they aren't of God, but God will certainly use those bring glory to his name and to his people. That's what he wants to do with you, but, but the thing is, is, Nehemiah can't do this alone. You can't do this alone. In fact, even with God's help, you're not going to do this alone. We are the body of Christ, and there are people everywhere who will come together, even unexpectedly, to come and help. Of the people who are going to come and help to do a working witness at this church, it was the Bitterroot Valley of Montana is the least likely that I thought, because their drive is like 14 hours. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a long drive. Because they're going to have to stop for gas and, and food and other type of thing. By the time they get here, it's going to be like a 14 hour drive. It's a long drive. And there are a lot of other places around here that are like three, four hours that have said, that's just too far. Meanwhile, they fundraise to go to another country for a week to work. 
You know, and so, and so we start, and so sometimes that's discouraging. There's this discouragement around. We think there's nobody there for us, but really everybody's there, and it's oftentimes the least likely. In fact, I would even say, in our own faith journey, there are people who are not of this faith that might challenge us to grow in our faith. But unless we're willing to seek it or allow them to help, we may not ever know. This is Babylon. And some of the people going to work, and some of the people supporting the work, probably not even Jewish. They might not be Persian either. Right? So Jerusalem's prosperity, the science and hopes for their own, even. We have neighbors who are on the LDS church. Our kids all play together and they're great people. We've taken them out of the skate park and uh, the pickleball. <laughs> um, and riding bikes and, and they were in cross, the boys were in cross country with Ethan. And, and so the, 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 we were talking about doing the work here and, and the wife is very interested to see other churches other than their own. I don't know why, I'm not going to speculate. She just wants to see other churches other than that. But she's like, <clears throat> she's like, you need to let us know when you're going to be doing some work on drywall. She goes, I have no idea how to do it, but I'll certainly come and try. <laughs> and, and, and that's what we see. We see goldsmiths and perfume makers and merchants and, and Levites and priests, none of which have any skill traits in building wall. Building walls. Because there's something about joining together for a common cause. And there's also something about joining together when you know that there is, even if you're from different backgrounds, there is a supernatural force at work in it. And they believe. We mustn't let the opportunity to be encouraged and be helped by others because we are not in this journey alone. In our faith, we are not alone in this journey. And some of the most unexpected people can help us along the way. Which means they might be people that we just detest being around. We really do. I think of Paul and his traveling and going well for the early church, right? Even when it comes, even when it comes to before even Paul, we get to like chapter five, and uh, the apostles are just going crazy. The church is just exploding, and you have Gamaliel who goes to battle and says, "Hey, don't do anything to these men because if it's not from God, it won't work. But if it's from God, you're going to be fighting God." And that gets you nowhere, right? We didn't even don't expect that. And, and he may just be reasoning, that doesn't mean he's sound logic. He may not support the apostles and what they're doing, but that certainly helped them from persecution getting worse. He didn't expect that help. Or Paul, I don't know how many times he was rescued or moved or, or worked with Roman officials who were like, no way, we're not going to let bad things happen to him. This is towards the end when he's already been arrested. Or, or even Jesus. We read John, Nicodemus comes to him at night, a very well known Pharisee, comes to him at night, they have a conversation, and he just leaves, never heard from him again until the very end of the book. It's he who comes before the official to give Jesus' body for a proper burial. And works together to get in a proper tomb. And now, now we might think, well, Jesus is dead at this, this point in time, but it's about honor. And it's about recognizing who he was and, and what he did, and going to those lengths would be to associate and to bring him honor worthy of a Jewish burial. Uh, we don't expect that. 
But we read the whole story, we never hear from him again. And suddenly there's this well known Pharisee that wants to help. We never know where that help is going to come from. We could not save ourselves. So our Lord came down to heaven, lived with us, dwelt with us, died for us in order to do what we could not do. To bring us salvation, to bring us hope, a joy that is not fleeting but everlasting. To bring peace, to be, bring peace that is simply a peace that we don't know or understand, a peace that this world doesn't know. To bring a love that is incomprehensible and reckless. But we are brought also into a mission, a purpose, and a calling. And as I was reading and, and studying this and looking at the words and all those who are helping and thinking of all those who have helped me before, I started thinking of Psalm 121 where it says, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither sleep nor neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm, and he will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forever. What a great comfort it is to know that the Lord is here to help us rebuild. Rebuild the church, rebuild our lives. He is in the, the business of creating, but which also means he's in the business of reconciling all that has been damaged by sin. And in joining in with him in a relationship, he's on a move. He's on this movement to reconcile and rebuild everything. And so in order to follow him as he's asked us to, invited us to, we are invited to join with him in that mission. I remember a time when I found a, a, a man, I was told about a man who might have suicidal ideas, ideations on a bridge. The 18th Street Bridge or the Vincent Street Bridge, or two roads named the same two different names, and he, he was on meth and down and out, and we just sat and we talked, and he wanted nothing to do with me, because he was a cop, and he was on meth. Um, and I didn't realize it, but I had actually sort of been a part of arresting him like a year ago for uh, having counterfeit money. But... Um, after the conversation, he eventually called me from the hospital where he had checked himself in. And he told me his story of being homeless and, and breaking into a house to sleep at night and people, you know, house for sale, and, and people coming to check on the house and do stuff upstairs because in the basement and he's so scared. And he never realized that he was really homeless. The whole time he'd been buying his friendships just to have a house to stay in for a period of time that counted as homelessness. And so he realized that he was homeless and he was on good drugs and, and the way he chose to spend his, spend his money. And he said, if there was anybody who was going to help or understand, it was this guy. My, my good friend Joe and I are still friends. And he's a born-again believer. I would have never expected to meet a friend like that through that way. And but that friend, I might have helped him. Yeah, he didn't expect that either. He didn't expect a cop to come into his life and become a good friend. But I would say he also helped me in a great way too to understand this sacrifice, that this love, this calling that God has given to us. 
So now as we leave the day, I want you to realize that there are people out there that are saying, where is help going to come from? They have no idea, and it's from you. Because it's from the Lord, and you are from the Lord. So as we join together in prayer, I want you to reflect on that. that somebody you know is probably in need of some sort of help. Encouragement, a good friend, probably somebody that you might not have talked to in a while. When that name pops into your head, randomly through the week, I haven't talked to them a lot. You better call them. Just call them. See what you can do. Because as, as people join together and have, have been a great part of the body of Christ to help nurture and to grow, to rebuild each, our lives and each other's lives, we are now a part of that mission and that call. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you for all that you have done and all the convenience and saving and sanctifying grace that you have woven in and throughout our lives to challenge us, to grow us, to move us, to transform us into your likeness, Lord. We thank you for all the help that you have provided along the way, the guidance and counseling through your holy word, or through the other people who, who come into our lives and challenge us in our faith, whether they're believers or not believers. Lord, we thank you and give you praise for where you have brought us here. And as we talked about this, this last Wednesday, you didn't bring us here just to leave us here, Lord, but we're going somewhere. We're on a mission and a calling from you. We've been with a purpose in our lives, Lord. We join in you with the ministry of reconciliation that we might be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world, reconciling relationships, bringing people out of addiction, and help giving people hope and peace and joy through the love of you, Lord. That is so overflowing in and through our lives. Lord, put our hands to the good work of building the church, Lord. Let's not be discouraged about the work that is ahead uh, because it's not comfortable or it's foreign to us or it's hard to us, Lord. But let us be encouraged that it's a work set before you today. And this finished project is going to bring you glory and to bring glory and honor to your people that we might be witnesses for your kingdom. Lord, we pray all these things in your gracious name. Amen. 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 Amen.